Hello, everyone. Thank you very much uh, to the organizers for such an amazing workshop. Um, I will, well, I think my, my talk, uh, I'm coming back to the Mediterranean, but um, ECOS pretty much, uh, um, well, let's say, ECOS somehow, uh, um, Kelly's idea of an alternative archive, um, and you will see. I, I built my presentation uh, thinking at this uh, simple question Bidisha raised early this morning, um, what happened to the bodies uh, drowned? Um, and I will start with a quote. I will first try to share my screen. Is it okay? Okay, great. So I'm starting with a quote. Uh, it gives me no pleasure to know that the last two bodies to arrive in Catania on June 13, 2018, are now resting in the town cemeteries called Morgue, forgotten by everyone and desecrated by a slow technocratic bureaucracy. Nobody kisses them now, they are dead. Such a gesture fills that otherwise often empty vessel that is humanity. A dichotomy between words and truth. The help of colleagues is providential. Sylvia's words are like a lifeboat to me and I saved the email Ricardo sent me a few days after the landing on January 8, 2018, as though it were a relic. On that day, eight bodies were disembarked now dispersed across different cemeteries on the island. Today, still, I keep the tombs of these bodies within me. I visit them every day. I have so much to ask them. They have so much to tell me. This is an excerpt from notes written by Davide. Davide, together with Ricardo, Silvia, and some other folks, uh, developed a project aimed at contributing to endeavors to identify the bodies of dead uh, border crossers arriving to Catania. Today, I would like to, to focus on how the bodies found at sea and taken to Catania, the ones which were taken, uh, are managed, exploring both their itinerary and how this small group of people from the city has become involved in this project to give them a name and a biography. I will draw here uh, on a fieldwork study uh, that I have been conducting together with my colleague, Filippo Furri, since January 2018, with the Catania Red Cross uh, Restoring Family Links program, around which the project question emerged. Uh, this this uh, Red Cross program, uh, as you might know, uh, was founded several decades ago to help families uh, searching for loved ones who had disappeared as a result of armed conflicts or, or, or natural disasters. And today it is largely uh, used to help reestablish family contacts that have been severed due to the conditions uh, in which people cross borders. So in Catania, this group of people uh, first drew a map uh, of migrant graves in the municipal cemetery and then began collecting um, all the information uh, that had been produced about these bodies by the various institutions involved in dealing with them. Uh, working on the hypothesis that connecting all data, all the data about one body might provide clues to identifying them, the aim or the ultimate aim to this project is to devise a technical tool a database, maybe an archive, um, that will allow unknown bodies to be identified and their families to be located. The intention is to make the traces left behind by the deceased to speak. Uh, with that uh, goal in mind, Silvia, Ricardo, David, and a few others uh, succeeded in, in convincing all the institutions more or less closely involved in managing the bodies uh, of the value of working together. And this enabled them uh, to obtain all the necessary authorizations to consult the files held about the deceased by um, all the police agencies, all the municipal administrative institutions and so on. So through the ethnography of the creation of this database, 
we were able to, um, to observe how the various actors who participated in the project, uh, including uh, Ricardo David and so on, uh, the, the, what, they call, what we call uh, the squadra, uh, worked and negotiated between different relationships to death, operating at, um, let's say, uh, to put it in a quite sim simple, maybe simplistic uh, way, uh, two, uh, two imbricated levels. On the one hand, uh, concrete management of the disease and the files uh, accompanying them, making their mobility uh, possible from the point of landing uh, to the cemetery where they are buried. And on the other hand, um, active involvement in the identification process, in the identification project, uh, translating the participants' desire to find out more about the dead and to take them in. Uh, between, uh, between 2015 and 2018, Catania became one of the main ports of arrival in Italy uh, for search and rescue operations in the central Mediterranean. And in March uh, 2016, the port of Catania became a mobile hotspot. Um, Several southern uh, people uh, whose lives were in danger at sea were brought to dry land, and alongside the living, uh, many others uh, did not survive the crossing. As you know, countless bodies remain somewhere at the bottom of the sea. Uh, but during this period, over 260 bodies were taken to were taken on to Catania. Uh, the dead, uh, the death. Uh, the dead, sorry, uh, are dealt with differently, um, differently depending uh, that there are, um, um, depending on their number. So, but the process always relies on the powers and needs of the municipality where they disembark whatever its economic situation. Uh, the authorities are warned that there are deceased passengers uh, before the boat docks, and the municipal undertakers prepare themselves. I'm just uh, putting the picture uh, for you to have an idea of how it works. And at the same time, the public, uh, the deputy public prosecutor appoints one uh, or more pathologists who will arrive on site uh, at the port in order to examine the bodies. This examination generally uh, consists in an external inspection, allowing them to determine the cause of death. The bodies are then taken to a morgue at one of the city's hospitals. And this is where DNA uh, samples are taken and where the forensic examination is carried out, um, obtaining information such as the uh, physical features, any distinctive signs such as tattoos, piercing, etc. Uh, clothes and objects uh, found on the body are sent to the public prosecutor's office um, where they are stocked in, a plastic, bag, in plastic bags. Uh, while the bodies are being transported, uh, a judicial investigation is launched. Uh, its aim uh, is to determine whether a crime has been committed, and if it has, to find the perpetrators. In other terms, it tracks the smugglers. Um, I don't have the time to talk about it, but uh, just uh, to put it very clearly, uh, if a crime is suspected, the public prosecutor can request an autopsy and proceed with an investigation, allowing uh, the victim to be identified. But the autopsy serves to determine the cause of death, uh, but for the death at sea, an external examination, um, the one that is conducted on site at the port, uh, is usually enough. As uh, for investigations to identify the bodies, if they do take place, um, we have never heard of them. Uh, it has never been mentioned in Catania or elsewhere. The reason is quite simple. Uh, there is no institution uh, tasked with identifying these bodies. Even when the survivors of a rich shipwreck provide a name for one of their traveling companions who had died, for instance, this does not lead to steps being officially undertaken for the body formally to be identified by the tribunal, which is the only um, uh, power to, which, which alone has the power to, to rule that an identification has satisfied the burden of proof. 
in other terms, the dead uh, negatively uh, mirroring uh, living migrants who are subjected, as you know, to a range of uh, procedures aimed at identifying them and ensuring their traceability uh, are not the subject of any official inquiry that might allow the name to be given to them. So the bodies remained in the morgue for a variable amount of time until the official documents delivered by the Public Prosecutor's Office and the Civil Registry indicate that it is possible to move them to the cemetery. The municipal cemetery um, in Catania is an amazing, it's an incredible place. I, I don't have much time to talk about it, but it's uh, fascinating from an ethnographic point of view. And in our investigation, uh, it allowed us to learn and understand many things related to the management of the bodies and to diverse forms of attachment to the dead. Uh, on my first, uh, yep. On my first visit to this huge cemetery, I saw this memorial uh, monument, which has inaugurated on March uh, 10, 2015, for the 17 victims who have been drowned the previous year and who were later joined by five more bodies from a shipwreck in May 2015. Plagues surround a sculpture, as you may see here. Um, and each gravestone bears the inscription of a verse from the poem Migrations by uh, the Nigerian author Walls Oyinka. That day, the day of my first visit, and all, almost every time I went, uh, I saw flowers on the graves. Not far from the monument, uh, there is a large, almost empty space. Uh, on the one side, a square with graves on the verge of falling into abandonment, crosses uh, and more simple metal plaques almost all bore uh, a name, a date of birth, a date of death. And Davide, Silvia and Ricardo who were with me uh, explained to me that this was the Cuadrato Poverta, the poverty square, where people with no family or whose loved ones could not afford uh, to pay for a burial were, uh, were inhumated. Uh, at the city's expenses. On the other side, here, uh, there was a slightly uh, sloped area uh, with four rows of 17, uh, of 17 mounds, each with a black metal plaque planted in the earth. On each of these alphanumeric codes would be read um, with dates and names of ships. So observing the, the cemetery and engaging into discussion uh, with the people working there, as well as with the undertakers and the civil registry, allowed us to piece together uh, the various developments in how bodies have been management, uh, had been managed. Sorry. In May 2014, for the first time, the Italian Maritime Coordination Center designated Catania at, as a disembarkation uh, port after a search and rescue operation conducted as part of uh, Marinostrum. The Italian Navy uh, ship, the Regale, uh, arrived in Catania port with uh, 266 uh, survivors and 15 dead aboard. Given that Italian law uh, consigns the management of death, uh, on its territory to, as I was saying, uh, to a municipal administration, the municipality had to organize itself as a matter of urgency. The bodies were transported to the morgue and the authorities came up with the idea of erecting uh, the monument, this monument, uh, to commemorate the dead. On April uh, 18, uh, 18, 2015, as you know, uh, one of the largest Mediterranean shipwrecks uh, claimed the lives of approximately uh, 1,000 people. Catania's public prosecutor was tasked with handling the case. The first, the first uh, bodies were retrieved in the, day, uh, in the days and months that followed, and their remains were examined in the nature base in Melili, uh, near the town of Augusta, but the public prosecutor in Catania had to find the destination for the first bodies. In order to avoid uh, dispersing the corpses throughout Sicily, what had been the case uh, with, a, with a ship for near Lampedusa in 2013, uh, they came out with this idea of, uh, of uh, 
of the Cuadrato Migrante uh, Migrant Square that came to be laid out opposite the Poverty Square. Uh, it first took 13, it took in uh, 13 bodies uh, labeled with a new classification. Um, but these bodies, uh, these bodies from, from this huge shipwreck, uh, were subjected to um, an exceptional protocol that was set up, decided by the national authorities that had released substantial funds uh, to recover the bodies from the sea, even salvage uh, the wreck itself, uh, and examine the human remains with a view of identifying them. And the task was entrusted to uh, the forensic pathologist and anthropologist Cristina Gattiani, director of the Labanoff Institute in Milan. And it also, the project also involved uh, the Italian Red Cross, the Red Cross uh, International Committee, the Italian National Commission of Missing Persons, and so on. A couple of months afterwards, in August 2015, a Norwegian ship docked at Catania. There were 49 bodies, uh, yeah, 49 bodies um, abroad, aboard, uh, people who had asph asphyxiated in the hold of a boat. This time, uh, no exceptional national protocol was set up, and it was up to the town to process them, to treat them. An investigation was opened by the public prosecutor, while the Border Sanitary Inspection Office set up a barrier of containers to, uh, to demarcate and isolate an area that the bodies could be dealt with and processed. Um, the public prosecutor made arrangements for the variants to be carried out quickly uh, because it was in the middle of a heat wave in August. Um, the, the codes given to the bodies uh, by the forensic police uh, um, were then used by the municipality and inscribed upon the metal plates that we discovered that day, that I discovered that day in my first visit to the cemetery. And as the disembarkations uh, were taking place on almost daily basis from then on, the city needed to deal with the presence uh, in its jurisdiction of many more, more dead bodies that its administrative infrastructure was capable of handling. More bodies required faster inspections and more efficient transfers for both public health and administrative reasons. And after this experience in August 2015, um, a dispositif in the, in the Foucauldian uh, sense of the term uh, for, for processing dead bodies and water emerged, which has since been activated on several occasions. But among all the bodies of those who have died in the Mediterranean and arrived in Catania since 2015, the only bodies uh, to be identified formally and repatriated, thanks to the mobilization of family uh, in their home country and members of the extended family in Europe, were three men from Pakistan. They had died from, like, from lack of oxygen in the hold of a boat, along with uh, 46 other, other people. Uh, their bodies, I said, uh, arrived two days later in Catania. They were taken to the morgue, then to a cemetery for burial, and then they were exhumed and began the journey back to their country of origin um, four months after uh, that death. They were taken to Napo uh, Naples, um, in the vehicle of an agency specializing in funerary transportation before being flown uh, to Rome and from there to Islamabad. While the, the rest of the journey and the accompanying rituals remain unknown to me, um, to us, what we do know is that all those who participated in identifying and transporting them still keep their passage through Catania fresh in their memory. There is no doubt uh, because these cases, these three uh, young men were as rare and as uh, they were clear. Uh, they had a complete death, explained Mrs. Giordano, who for many years now has been in charge of the civil registry office for migrants who have died at sea. There are case, there are case files 
have be, uh, a beginning and then the end, she explained. Their constituent documentation is complete and they can therefore be archived. At an institutional level, these three deaths are complete, whereas all the others, uh, all those upon which the Red Cross team is working using the database remain so far incomplete. However, the completeness of these deaths is not simply a question of administrative or of the state. It is also the shared aim of those working in the institutions involved in the management of these diseased bodies in Catania. Whether they are forensic, of, uh, forensic police officers, undertakers, pathologists, civil registry workers, whether they are young or approaching retirement, uh, whether the social profile and biographical trajectory is, all the people we met uh, cooperate actively with the Red Cross in the database project. And their participation goes together with a discourse that is empathetic in register. Just an example, those poor people, I'm quoting uh, Mrs. Giordano, uh, when I think about them, I think that they left to find a better life for themselves, for their families, just as we would do. They are young, they are like our people, our young people. Similarly, Mr. Mancini, the head of the undertaker office at the cemetery told us, we treat them like any other body, but to tell the truth, we are distressed by them the same way we are distressed by the death of a young person here who dies in an accident. During discussions with different people we met within the institutions, we had numerous um, statements connecting these others about whom they knew little with an us, Catanians, Sicilians, Italians, Europeans, depending on the interlocutor and the context. And the words frequently uh, stressed a shared humanity to take, up, uh, to take up Davide's words I was quoting at the beginning of my talk. And the discussions, uh, in the discussions, and there is a frequent connection that is made between the unfortunate, the skinny Sicilian, uh, this unfortunate young migrant, and the youth from here that speak to a possible uh, familiarity for my interlocutors. And this familiarity, yeah, I'm, I'm finishing. Okay, yeah. okay. Sorry, sorry, sorry. No problem. Uh, this familiarity, and more than that, I would say uh, this form of relatedness is often expressed. Uh, li portiamo a casa. Uh, we bring them home. Um, many interlocutors speak of some of the dead using the first names or surnames that were mentioned in a testimony or in, in, a, in a document which in fact are not a result of the identification process, uh, but it's uh, a tentative to humanize them. They sometimes give names. And it seems to me that a new way for these deaths to be uh, socially enrolled arises. Our interlocutors' practices and discourse serves, uh, serve as um, uh, acts of extension, to quote uh, Vantian Depré, that allows the dead to exist in their lives, both in a set of actions directed towards them to commemorate them, help identify them, and in conversations with their friends or in their dreams. Mrs. Pesina from the Policia Scientifica told her daughter in detail, or at least with the detail she, she, she had, the life and trajectory of the three uh, young Pakistanis who were repatriated. Mr. Mancini also used to talk uh, about some dead migrants, uh, I'm quoting, uh, to his wife and children. Mrs. Giordano often dreams of dead youngsters whose lives she imagines. I'm, I'm finishing with, with uh, another quote. The dead should be mourned, but who mourns for these dead people? Are they mourned? Asked Ricardo after a day of disembarking bodies. I think in, in, in the context of, uh, of a reflection upon the value of life in contemporary Western world, uh, Ricardo's question can be seen echoing this unreliability um, Butler talks about um, of the almost inherently precarious and vulnerable lives led by migrants. Uh, however, I think that our ethnography 
uh, in Catania leads us to believe that these deaths in the Mediterranean do uh, in fact produce a grieving process. A grief by proxy, I would say. A grief by proxy, uh, uh, as, as I were the father, the mother, the sister, uh, as she or he cannot mourn, well, I do. And we have here um, a sort of um, uh, inverted mirror at, at, at a tiny level of the refoulement by proxy uh, Charles, uh, Charles was talking about uh, early, earlier. All the people, I'm, that's my last paragraph, uh, <laughs> all the people we spoke with were engaged in processing uh, these bodies and as such initially uh, approached them from a technical material perspective. However, they all soon expressed forms of empathy first uh, related to shared humanity. And then the modalities whereby connections were made to these bodies expressed the need to extend a kind of hospitality, albeit in death. And indeed, hospitality is the term that came up time and time again in the discussions and the interviews we have been conducting. Families may not always be able to cry for their dead, but each person involved in these dead people, uh, involved with these dead people, uh, by processing their case file, uh, by gathering together their remains, made a place for them uh, in his or her life. Many shed, uh, shed tears for them. And these deaths exist in the array of experiences and practices shared by those involved in the project. They are also present within the city uh, with, uh, with the monuments and the plagues. I don't have the time to talk about them. Uh, but I think it is as though uh, it were possible together to ward off oblivion and hold them close by giving them a home in this world. Thank you. So first of all, can you hear and, and see me properly? Okay, great. So uh, first of all, many thanks to uh, Tanati Ketis project for organizing this uh, stimulating workshop. So it's also a pleasure for me to, to share this, uh, this panel with uh, Carolina and, and Kelly. So I would like also to, to apologize for having postponed my, uh, previously my presentation uh, during the seminar series. Uh, so thanks to uh, Vidisha and Thomas for their kind passions as I was uh, captured by my, my field work in Senegal. So actually I just uh, came back from, from there. So my research is part of the Migration, Transnationalism and Social Protection in Europe uh, ERC funded project that uh, looks at policies and, uh, policies and practices sorry, shaping migrants' access to social protection in home and host countries. So what I will present you today are some preliminary results of uh, the PhD research that I, uh, I started two, two years and a half ago. So I will see if I can uh, share my screen. All right, here. Okay, does it work? Perfect. So, um, transnational engagements around Senegalese migrants' deaths. So, I will first contextualize you uh, a few elements uh, regarding uh, Senegalese uh, migrant deaths uh, routes to, to Europe. So, so, Spanish media and uh, authorities turned the so called bold people crisis of 2006 uh, the Canary Islands hyper visible as it uh, was indeed the, the starting of uh, external border control practices between Europe and Senegal, uh, and the deployment also of the well-known uh, HERO operation, uh, Frontex operation, when around uh, 30,000 sub-Saharan migrants reached the, uh, the island. So the slogan, as you can see in this painting, Barça wala Barça, that means in all of going to Barcelona or dying, um, well, expressed and highlights the, the Senegalese popular representation uh, of uh, that period around migration and death uh, during the journey. So afterwards, in, since 2016, and more recently, uh, during last fall in uh, November 2020, uh, there was a significant increment also of the Senegalese uh, migrants' irregular arrivals to the Canary Islands and the consequent reinforcement of mobilizations of the Spanish security forces. So actually, uh, when I just came back and I took my flight at the airport of Dakar, I could see also that there is a, a presence of uh, Spanish security forces 
controlling also documents of the, the travelers. So it helps a lot. Um, at the same time, Senegalese authorities remained quite silent uh, around the, the issue during last fall, uh, while a civil society collective emerged in Senegal, so the collective 480, so uh, 1480, uh, it's enough in reference to the first 480 deaths that were counted on the migration routes to the Canary Islands, which is, of course, uh, an underestimated number. So this led, among other, to some anonymous burials in, in Dakar for bodies that were recovered along the Senegalese coasts by fishing boats, but also along the migration journey uh, along the coast of Mauritania, Morocco, or uh, in the uh, Canary Islands themselves. But I won't focus uh, uh, in my presentation on, on this uh, issue. It was just to, to frame it shortly. Because, however, and once reaching Europe, the, the embodiment of illegality, especially in Spain and, so, and southern Europe, exposed still Senegalese migrants to the risk of death, as we will see further. And on the other hand, of course, regular migration routes, uh, while securing migrants' journey, do not prevent the, the often inevitable deaths in destination countries and the related multiple forms of transnational engagements. So let's move to my research question. So how do community and family networks, as well as market and states, engage transnationally around Senegalese migrant threats? So I decided to, to articulate the, the following bodies of literature that you, most of you, uh, I guess, uh, well know. So anthropology and death, migration and death, and transnational social protection, which is more related to our research project. So anthropology gives us indeed the inputs to, to, to address the diversity of meanings and functions of, of death in context of migration, so in a Durkheimian understanding of it. So the bad deaths uh, jeopardize the cohesion of the community, whether familiar, social, or political. And however, through mobilizations, death can also be a vehicle for rebuilding cohesion. So that is why it's also important to take into account the productive, the productive political dimension of death. So we can see indeed that coffins, in the example of the picture I took during a demonstration in Brussels, can become symbolically political tools. tools. So, so let's, move, let's move now to transnational social protection. Move short. Ah, I don't know. It's not fair. Here we are. OK. So body repatriation and further engagement, uh, engagement around violent death express the need to to ensure a funerary social protection, not only for the deceased, but also for the community, the family, and the state. On one hand, we have, uh, we, can frame, we can frame expressions from below that are shaped by migrant community and family between a kind of relationship of solidarity, reciprocity, but also obligations toward the deceased and the community. So this is the main cause for mobilization, as we will see further. On the other hand, we have also expressions from above that are shaped by diaspora institutions in origin countries, but also some uh, engagements uh, of destination countries in cases, for instance, of uh, municipalities. So let's see then some methodological aspects. So I'm conducting a, a multi site ethnography between Belgium, Spain, and Senegal with, a, with diverse actors, such as migrant associations, but also migrant families, home and host states authorities. Uh, Senegalese cemeteries and markets. So the um, focusing point, the key transnational practice that I, 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 try, I try to follow since I started my research is the practices body repatriation. So this manner I could observe through different segments between sometimes in Europe, in Belgium, in Spain, or in Senegal. Well, the, the different steps of this challenging practice, but also trying to catch what other, other engagements take place beyond this practice. So let's continue then with uh, some first results that I wanted to, to show you. So uh, in Belgium, despite a relatively small Senegalese population, we have four Senegalese migrant associations that are based explicitly around body repatriations. So they have uh, different solidarity understandings and ethnic origins, and conversely in Spain, uh, religious and cultural organizations are those who support body repatriation. But some initiatives uh, of the structured regimes of body repatriation are recently emerging. So we have different uh, patterns and times of migration also between two countries. So in case of, uh, of the death of a non-member of uh, those associations, spontaneous calls of support 
are not only possible, but also very quick and efficient, as they embrace through multiple scale of communications, local and transnational givers, so no matter the ethnicity, nationality, and even the, their knowledge of the deceased. So, of the deceased. So, so it happens that, for instance, someone in New York or in Milan uh, would give uh, for, uh, for a disease in Belgium. So following the words of a participant, uh, this is the number one cause for solidarity. Another research participant told me uh, in the same way, we must contribute because if I don't give, who will give for me? So this brings also about the counter gift that the giver will receive when, when dying. And so therefore to give is just also a manner to, to plan and ensure the, the future good death of, of the giver. So let's focus now on the particularity of uh, violent death. All right, so um, among other uh, violent deaths, Two, I focused on, on two violent deaths of Senegalese street vendors that became, became very emblematic in Spain. So as you can see in the flyer uh, done for the Black Lives Matter mobilization in Madrid, we have a, in particular two figures, uh, the one of uh, Mambai, who died in, on the left, who died in Madrid in 2018, and the one of Morsila on the right, who died in Barcelona in 2015. So both died of after police uh, persecution. So those deaths, uh, expressed before and, and then after uh, in Senegalese migrants' bottom-up political mobilization in Spain, because they significantly triggered the, the emergence of, uh, the emergence of uh, several activist organizations, such as street vendor syndicates, along, all around the country. So it was like a boom, as uh, stated uh, an activist. Justice and memory for those deaths were the first claims, but they also get rid much more fights, so anti-racism, anti-capitalism, and so on. So those deaths became very powerful flags for, for empowerment. However, with such a, a diverse implication of uh, factors around those deaths, some conflict of uh, representation take also place. So violent deaths unite, but also divide, especially in, when it comes to, to justice, where family members tend uh, to be uh, fighting alone. Um, so this seems thus to be a contested political tool. So now let's see what about, uh, what about the engagement from, uh, from, from authorities. So it appears that states um, react to discretionary measure to those uh, violent deaths in particular that crystallize engagement. So Senegalese states uh, engagement around the deaths of its citizens has been evolving over time. So there is a fund of emergency covering some repatriation uh, that is available uh, since with a discretionary power of decision. So, and it's based on typology of deaths, including cases of uh, assassinates or those kind of disturbing deaths. No? Uh, however, there is uh, also a new trend of redirecting the, the beneficiaries uh, of this fund to, to private insurances. So more generally, whatever the, the cause of, uh, of deaths with a special discounts that, could, uh, that would be negotiated uh, by the diaspora institutions and the market. So in this way, the state aims to, to incentivize Senegalese abroad to register to consular lists for voting and accessing to a kind of package, as they call it, of uh, benefices that could include body repatriation insurance. So I took this pic picture in Dakar, we, uh, just close to the main uh, public cemetery, where we can see one of those uh, new offers uh, of the market with a special target to the diaspora. So um, at destination countries, uh, states uh, may also engage uh, around, around this. So for instance, and, and exceptionally in the case of Spain, some Spanish municipalities um, have been supporting uh, with discretion some fees for body repatriation of cases of migrants who died in violent con conditions, such uh, cases of uh, assassinates. Uh, fearing that time uh, riots such as those that happened in Madrid and in Barcelona after the death of the street vendors uh, that I um, did uh, mention before. So on the on the other end, in co the context of the, the pandemic, some European states have imposed the requirements or even prohibited the repatriation of uh, COVID-19 victims. So I had indeed a very info recent information that uh, uh, Belgium Belgium uh, seems to, to impose a quarantine of two weeks uh, to the, the body before repatriation, while Spain refused uh, the repatriation of uh, at least some bodies, such as the one of uh, 
Senegalese migrants that died recently in Catalonia. So let's uh, move now to what happened uh, in particular with uh, the engagement around uh, COVID-19 deaths. They reveal very original forms of engagement. So uh, what happened? Senegal, uh, despite having uh, repatriated part of its living citizens abroad at the starting of the pandemic, has decided to prohibit the repatriation of COVID-19 victims. So this, uh, this was a, between early April, April and early March, so one month. So however, uh, and during that month, the state implemented consular emergency programs that included funding of burial of its citizens who died of COVID-19 in Europe. But this raised very important mobilizations, such as the creation of a transnational associative campaign, so the, the CRC, the Collective for Body Patriation, with the, the, lemon, the slogan in role of Sunineu, Sunureu, so our bodies in our country, in order to pressure the state decision. So diverse actors such as doctors, lawyers, uh, finally reached their, their goal for ensuring to the fallen martyrs uh, as they were targeted, uh, their rights for repatriation. So what was interesting also is that the participants were sure about uh, the, their victory since the, the campaign started, and uh, the state finally reauthorized the repatriation of COVID-19 victims, with special rules, so the implication of the firemen for body transport of the coffins from the airport, to the cemetery and then the implication of the local Red Cross for uh, burial, but which uh, has been a dispositive quite hard to, to, to set and to, to maintain. So let's focus now on the administration of corpses arriving in Senegal. So um, I had the, the chance to, to conduct a field work at the, uh, at the airport of Dakar and at the, the cargo zone, so I could uh, assist also families uh, uh, waiting for the arrival of uh, the body of uh, their, their loved ones. Uh, and Dakar International Airport is therefore the focal point for the arrival of bodies. So the, the management of coffins is carried by airline companies and the two AS uh, Dakar's airport cargo company. Uh, so there, the transport of coffins is, is framed legally as a, as a transport of, of merchandise. So uh, it tells about a kind of a, a liminar ontology between a person and object, which is thus given to the, to the corpse, corpse merchandise. So according to the, the company officer, it's a special merchandise that it has to be manipulated with, with caution and, and an effort of free service is given from this company for the management of the, uh, the merchandise once arrived at uh, the cargo zone. Um, and on the other hand, the airlines are, of course, uh, for profit companies that offer uh, costly transport of the body and are therefore not solidary, at, uh, as an employee remarked. So after being uh, delivered, uh, here's uh, the corpses are, are taken by here's drivers or family convoys who receive the, the coffin and undertake sometimes very long journeys uh, before burial, sometimes carrying the coffin on the roof of the vehicle. So we'll see now uh, how bodies are uh, administrated in the urban cemeteries of, uh, of Dakar and Touba. Okay, so uh, the city and then cemetery of Touba, which is a second Senegalese major city after the capital, and it's uh, located uh, a few hundred kilometers on, on the east. Um, so Touba attracts uh, believers from all around the world, as it is the only uh, city, the transnational capital of the Murid Brotherhood. So constructing, building house, but also being buried in Tuba is seen as a promise for the access to paradise. So the necropolis population is uh, therefore increasing as the city's uh, population increases also. So, and however, all the, there is all the transnational chain, which is deployed by um, the religious brotherhood to verify the information, as they, they, they say in their, in their terms, about the deceased and control who can be buried and which corpses are refused for burial. So, for example, uh, there was a case of a Senegalese migrant of, uh, of homosexual orientation uh, who died in Belgium and was refused for, for burial by religious authorities uh, during the, the last months. And on the other hand, uh, the main cemetery of, uh, of Dakar, the capital city, reveals a sort of translocal administration by com communal and urban authorities ensuring a, a free service of Hirsi's transport 
and going often far beyond their territorial responsibilities towards the airport, uh, which is located at uh, 50 kilometers away from the capital city, but they also go to Tuba and even to remote regions of the interior of the country. So at the cemetery, the administration uh, deals sometimes also with difficulty between uh, body repatriation burial uh, international requirements and the traditional practice of burial without the coffin. So we will finally examine uh, what, what happens after the body repatriation process, such as the implication of survivors' uh, pensions. All right, so last but not least, the, the way the migrant uh, contributed regularly or not to social security systems in destination countries, um, influence significantly the economy of its transnational family after the death of the migrant. So this way, families may access to Spanish and uh, Italian survivors' pensions doing act of survival every year in, in Dakar. So I could conducted the work there um, in uh, the Spanish embassy and uh, in uh, Italian syndicates, uh, so two institutions that ensure the access to survival pensions, uh, but with very trusted positions. Sorry. So there is the case of the, the Italian Patronati, uh, which is uh, actually a syndicate financed by the, the Italian state for granting social protection rights to workers and, and the family. So this case is quite unique, uh, as it is nevertheless uh, still a, a non state actor, but with, and with a clear syndical orientation. So they want also to open an office in Tuba. Um, well, and the other case is the Spanish Embassy uh, with a consular uh, authorities uh, management of uh, the issue. So um, cases of polygamy, the traditional practice of new marriage of widows, but also uh, situation of uh, analphabetism or distance with uh, the, uh, the administration are some features that, that challenge also the access to, to pension. Um, and on the other hand, when, when accessing it, the pension enable uh, micro entrepreneurship for, for family, families. Sorry. So now let's, let's conclude. I hope I'm good with time. So in conclusions, we can see that there is a, a very large diversity of uh, expressions of transnational engagement around this that shape also the future of, uh, of the living. So first, body repatriation uh, as the number one cause for solidarity implies uh, national engagement of a diversity of factors uh, here and there between the, uh, the planification of the death and the political activity and sometimes between administration uh, of, uh, of the death also. So the very uh, different patterns of nihilist migration between Belgium and Spain shaped uh, very contrasted profiles also that deal with uh, different uh, uh, capitals and needs uh, around the issue, but among the same core concerns. So ensuring a good death to the deceased, but also the regeneration of the communities, ties and life. So while they give birth to new actors such as social movements, violent deaths are very bad deaths that disturb and crystallize engagement. So revealing contested legitimacies to engage, to speak, to pay for, and through the deaths between migrant as associations, the families of the victims and the state. So once I arrived in Senegal, the corpses merchandised are first managed by private sector and then, then by public or religious local authorities, all engaging in different scales, wanting facilities for transport and burial or controlling the information about the, about the repatriated. Um, after the death of the migrants, transnational families' economy is still affected by post-mortem social protection, as seen. Uh, so accessing European survivors' pensions in Dakar gives them an opportunity to micro-entrepreneurship, not with difficulty with the transnational administrations. So there's, um, in a few words, has the potential to be a constructive vehicle. It embraces indeed broader concerns that this itself and shape the future of transnational relationships between all those transnational actors. So in a, in a nutshell, you can see also through the very explicit logos designed by a, a collective claiming for the free body repatriation, body repatriation of Senegalese migrants, Sorry, body repatriation remains a core concern for migrants, a real brain teaser, André Castet. So for further debate, we could uh, still think about the idea of a right for body repatriation beyond a legal, a legal understanding of it, as we started working comparatively on this uh, issue with my colleague, uh, Carol Wenger, uh, wondering how is this right uh, framed or perceived in other countries, such as Tunisia or Pakistan, 
where body repatriation is granted uh, public funded rights since decades. So thank you very much for your attention. And I would very appreciate your questions and comments to improve my, my research. Thank you.